Franklin, BV-13, was commissioned January 1944 and engaged in her first enemy action in July 1944. She sustained minor damage on 13 and 15 October and extensive damage 30 October from fire and bomb detonations following a suicide plane crash through the flight deck. After completion of repairs at Puget Sound, she rejoined a carrier task group at Ulithi. This advanced staging base, with an anchorage sufficiently large to provide berths for almost 1,000 warships, played an important role in our conquest of the Philippines and other Japanese-held territory further west and north. Here, ships received supplies and made minor repairs in preparation for strikes against targets on the Japanese islands of Kyushu and Honshu. On March 15th, the task force proceeded toward its objective. On the morning of 19 March, the task force was less than 100 miles off the coast of Honshu. Launching of a pre-dawn fighter sweep was completed at 0557. 45 of Franklin's planes were aloft, and 53 remained on board. 31 were spotted on the flight deck, all fully gassed, and armed with a total of 66 500-pound, 20 250-pound general purpose bombs, 12 11.75-inch rockets, commonly called Tiny Tims, and machine gun ammunition. There were approximately 17,000 gallons of gasoline in the planes on the flight deck. In the hangar, there were 22 planes, of which five were gassed and armed with one tiny Tim rocket each, 11 were fully gassed and not armed, and six were defueled and not armed. Approximately 9,000 gallons of gasoline were in the gas planes on the hangar deck. At 0617, the task group commander aboard Franklin ordered condition three set on all aircraft batteries and material condition yoke set on all ships. On Franklin, instead of material condition yoke, a modified condition zebra actually was set, which provided for one-sixth of the crew to be relieved for breakfast and for one designated hatch from the hangar to the second deck to be opened. The engineering plant was split. The fire main system was divided into eight sections. The sky was overcast with occasional breaks and low scattered clouds. Horizontal visibility was good. Although Franklin's radar screen was clear, Hancock reported that a twin-engine enemy plane had been sighted. At 0649, the ship was brought into the wind, and speed increased to 24 knots to launch the day's first heavy strike. The forward gasoline system was secured and purged with inert gas. The after system was in operation. Topping off had just been completed on the flight deck. Three planes were being topped off in the after part of the hangar. At 0708, an enemy plane dove out of the base of a cloud from less than 2,000 feet altitude, about 1,000 yards ahead, made a low-level bombing run, dropping two bombs as it passed over Franklin at mass height. One bomb struck the flight deck, the port of the center line, at frame 68 penetrated through the hangar and detonated upon impact or just after ricocheting off the armored hangar deck. The second bomb was reported to have struck the flight deck in the vicinity of the after elevator and penetrated to the hangar where it detonated in the way of parked planes. A heavy vapor explosion followed. Flames filled the hangar and shot out of elevator openings and hangar sides. Within one to four minutes, the first of many heavy explosions occurred. Tiny Tim rockets detonated early. Some were projected off the ship. Explosions continued over a five-hour interval. White plumes from high-order detonations displaced the black smoke of burning gasoline. Small caliber ammunition, 20 and 40 millimeter and five-inch projectiles in ready service boxes and upper handling rooms exploded low order. Some intact bombs were blown off the ship and exploded in the water. After the ship was turned to put the wind on the starboard bow, 
the smoke was cleared from the forward end, and despite continuous detonation, firefighters attacked the conflagration. Explosion of small caliber ammunition, identified by incandescent particles in the smoke, was annoying, but did not injure personnel. Firefighting water pressure from forward lines was good at first, but as risers in the hangar were broken, the pressure failed on many lines and was reduced on others. A few spaces in the island were gutted by fire, some few other spaces filled with smoke, but vital control spaces remained tenable. Heavy explosions continued in the after part of the ship. Some sprinkling and water curtain systems in the hangar were turned on, but because of extensive destruction of risers and overhead piping, only those in bay number one were affected. Approximately one and one half hours after the initial detonation, dense smoke entered through the port vent trunk, forcing evacuation of all engineering spaces. As the fire forward subsided, firefighters were able to move aft. After engineering spaces were abandoned, all power was lost. Gasoline mains in and out board of the hangar were broken, but the gasoline system below this level was not involved. Burning gasoline from plain fuel tanks drained out on the starboard quarter in way of roller doors. From the time the power was lost until all fires were out, the only firefighting pressure available was from one forward diesel pump. Ammunition in the upper handling and gun rooms for twin mount number seven ignited late in the fire and although some projectiles exploded low order, there was no high order or mass detonation despite an intense powder fire. Cruisers and destroyers came alongside and played hose streams on the fire. As firefighting water accumulated, the ship assumed a starboard list. By 1200, five hours after the initial damage, explosions and detonations had ceased. All gasoline contained in aircraft fuel tanks had been consumed, and most aircraft had been demolished. Isolated fires continued to burn and flare up for several hours. The forward auxiliary machinery space was re-entered, and the main distribution board was energized from the forward emergency diesel generator, which had operated continuously at no load. Ventilation blowers were started, and smoke was cleared from other machinery spaces. At 1400, Franklin was taken in tow by a heavy cruiser. Boilers were lit off, and main engines were warmed up and subsequently turned over to assist the tow. Maximum starboard lift was 15 degrees. Port damage control voids were flooded, and the ship gradually came up on an even keel, and then gradually assumed a port lift, which reached a maximum of 10 degrees. Few aircraft engines and piles of slag and debris were all that remained of the 33 planes on the flight deck. The forward elevator platform was blown upward by the initial blast and assumed a canted position as it fell. Even before the fires were out, the ship's company turned to cleaning up the wreckage. Fires continued to rekindle for several hours. Jumper hose lines in the hangar were connected from intact risers below. Portable extinguishers were used to control isolated fires. The hangar and gallery were in ruins after the forward elevator. Only two men stationed in the hangar survived. Jeeps were invaluable in clearing the wreckage. The deck edge elevator ramp was the most convenient place to jettison wreckage. It was difficult to jettison from other openings because of roller curtain guides and the shear straight, which extended above the hangar deck. Four holes were blown in the two and one half inch armored section of the hangar deck, one by the Jap bomb at frame 87, and three by ship's bombs, presumed to be tiny Tim's, at frames 93, 100, and 145. The hole at frame 145 was about six by six feet, the second and third decks below this hole were ruptured by blast and fragments. 
The armored fourth deck was pitted but not penetrated. The hangar deck and the armored bulkhead to the forward uptake space were ruptured at frames 193. Air intake ducts within the uptake space were ruptured. This permitted water to drain from the hangar into the forward boilers. At frame 87, detonation of the first Jap bomb blew a 6 by 12 foot hole in the hangar deck. The second deck below was penetrated by four structural fragments. The conflagration station was wrecked by blast and fragments. Personnel on watch were killed before they could operate the controls. A large hole was blown in the unarmored section of the hangar deck of aft frame 166. The after elevator was wrecked by blasts, fragments, and fire. One of the five Tiny Tim rockets in the hangar failed to detonate. The motor casing lodged in the after elevator pit. The grid was found on the deck. The head continued aft, passing through light bulkheads, finally coming to rest in a cruise space at frame 157. The unexploded head was removed by bomb disposal officers at Ulithi. About 40% of the general purpose bombs exploded low order. Boiler air intake duct frame 130, starboard side, and the after bomb elevator trunk were damaged extensively. Water drained down to the plenum chamber on the fourth deck and overflowed the air intake openings for the after boilers. Stiffeners on the armored bulkheads of the after uptake, space frames 111 to 121, were deflected, but the one inch STS effectively defeated fragment attack. Light metal panels forming light traps and ladders were demolished. Gallery walkways and structures were wrecked by blast and fire. Numerous personnel were trapped in the gallery by this damage and by the lack of accesses, port and starboard. One or more bombs which dropped from the flight deck demolished the gallery deck structure in way of the gun platform for single mount numbers six and eight on the port quarter. The local auxiliary five-inch director was undamaged. The forward elevator platform was used as a ramp to the flight deck. The flight deck was practically demolished after the after elevator. All that remains of planes are a few engines and debris. Wood planking on the deck burned off and the deck plating sagged from extreme heat. A large hole in the edge of the flight deck, port side, frames 118 to 130, was erroneously reported to have resulted from mass detonation of a five-inch rocket motor stowage magazine on the gallery. Rocket motors stowed on the port side, frames 131, 134, burned but did not explode. The damage shown was caused by detonation of a 500-pound bomb which dropped from the flight deck to about the gallery deck level, where it detonated late in the fire. Location of planes on the flight deck prior to damage cannot be definitely associated with the individual holes in the deck after damage because planes were bounced around after the explosion started. Some planes were blown clear of the ship. Some dropped down to the hangar with their bomb loads. The flight deck vent abaft the after expansion joint was deflected aft and sagged downward, principally from heat. The large hole in the deck abaft the expansion joint resulted from bomb detonations and heat. It measured roughly 60 by 80 feet. Between frames 120 and 80, the flight deck was warped and sagged and the planking was charred. Forward of frame 80, damage to the flight deck was negligible, except for the entry hole of the first Jap bomb and for holes chopped in the deck to fight fires in gallery spaces. Damage to island structure was not severe. 
Fire damaged inboard bulkheads and gutted some spaces. STS plating effectively defeated fragment attack. Repair station number seven was made untenable by smoke and heat, but damage control gear stowed in this space was not affected. Although twin mount number seven was gutted by fire, canvas gun port bloomers remained intact. The top mast and the main mast were broken at the radar platform level. The SC-3, SG, and SM radar antennas toppled inboard. The Holocaust which Franklin experienced was the worst which any United States carrier survived in World War II. Examination and analysis definitely revealed that the most important single material factor in her survival was the two and one half inch STS hangar deck, which acted as an effective shield for below deck spaces. 